Tech Talks, the People and Planet podcast. Today, I am joined by Stephen Costello, the co-founder and CEO of Spectrum Life. Stephen, good morning. Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, really looking forward to, to learning more about Spectrum Life um, and everything that, that you guys tackle, because it doesn't just tackle one specific thing, but it's a, it's a healthcare technology platform. Um, Tell us more. Um, what's the problem that you guys solve with the company mission? How how are you inspired to to build this? Yeah. So uh, thanks very much. So you know, Spectrum Life is a a whole of health uh, digital partner, and uh, we we aim to kind of engage, empower, and transform uh, the, the the people that we serve. So our customers are insurers, employers, and and education providers. Uh, but in terms of, you know, what our mission is and what we're trying to achieve and the problem that we're trying to solve. So, you know, our mission is to change and save as many lives as possible. And, you know, internally, we bring together really eclectic mix of people, I suppose, working towards that that mission. You know, we have clinicians in house. We've got our own technology team, but we're also quite a high growth organization. So we've got a lot of commercial people as well. But like, you know, the the, the problem we're solving is, is is obvious. I suppose it's around us, you know, the UK specifically. You know, the population of people reporting mental health issues has increased from 25% in, in 2018 to 40% now. Similar increase in, in Ireland as well. Uh, there are 2 million people in the UK have been judged unfit for work and nearly 70% of them would cite a mental health uh, issue as part of that assessment. You know, there's 1.9 million people on the waiting list and a quarter of them are children uh, for mental health issues. So. You know, the problem we're solving, uh, you know, for, for the world and society, I suppose, is is access to uh, personalized uh, care. Yeah. And this year, our, our clinicians will see over 250,000 uh, people, individual people across the UK and Ireland. And our technology uh, will enable another half a million people, I suppose, to see one of our, our, our service partners or one of our, our, our partner customers uh, through through our technology. So. I suppose that's what we're solving for the world and, and our mission is to change and save as many lives as possible. Got it. I like it. That was a crazy stat as well about the kids. Um, yeah. You know, you said that 1.9 million people would have mental health issues and 25% ha- and, uh, of those would be children. So 1.9 million people are on a waiting list for mental health treatments right, in the UK okay. and, and a quarter of them are, are children. And that's nearly, that's really... nearly half a million kids that are on a waiting list for for mental health problems. Yeah, yeah, and uh, this this year we we launched a kind of a, a, a two kind of uh, service pathways that have been really interesting to, to roll out. You know, uh, it's child and adolescence mental health and then neurodiversity assessments. But what we found, it was quite a big project to get off the ground. A lot of specialist clinicians, a lot of tech that requires parents, the children themselves, teachers, different people to interact with the technology. But what we found was just culturally, it was a problem that people internally really wanted to get behind. So even though it was kind of quite a mountain to climb, the fact that it touched people you yeah. know, so personally that people were willing to get behind it and people were willing to go the extra mile to get it done. So I, I think that's what I love about what we do. And we're able to combine you know, solving a problem for the world or society in general but you have people that are really passionate about doing it. We're not just pushing yeah. widgets around. We're not doing something that is kind of a cog and I suppose a bigger kind of maybe efficiency wheel or productivity software, or whatever it happens to be. You know, when we actually have problems, there are people at the end of those solutions that were that were making their lives, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, inst- you know, incrementally better or even just a little bit better because they've got access earlier than they, they than they would have got access to. So talk us through the product set itself then. Um, how does that work to, to help to solve those problems that we just discussed? Yeah, so from, a, I suppose, a, a product uh, perspective, um, from a product perspective, I suppose, what we're, I'll go back a few steps. So for, specifically, if a lot of the work that we do is around insurers um, and Post-COVID, following uh, the the boom in digital health demands uh, for members, you know, insurers are in a position in which one they want to take control of their of their digital journey. So there's a lot of fragmentation um, within their digital journeys, and what we enable them to do is put uh, our technology in their apps and web platforms. 
to really engage and uh, personalize a positive touch point. So insurers, I suppose, are used to engaging with their customers in a way that is transactional, it's claiming, it's you know renewing, it's you know uploading documents. So we aim to add our, I suppose, our, our, our engaging health and wellbeing content and tools into that insurance kind of portfolio. Uh, we then enable them to uh, build care pathways that empower them and their members to access the right care uh, when they need it. And then once we get the person into that space, then we actually power the technology of the health consultation itself. So that's, you know, your booking, your reminders, your, you know, your notes, your referrals, all of that kind of stuff that our clinicians are involved with as well, or they can plug in a different uh, service partner. So I suppose what we're trying to do is, and our philosophy is engage, empower and transform. Yeah. So it's like a it's like a marketing funnel. How can we get as many people into the top of the funnel as possible through content and tools? How can we empower them to know what they need to do next and personalize that experience? And then finally, then how can we actually deliver transformational care um, or enable transformational care to happen all within an insurer's brand or we have a direct uh, B2B uh, solution as well. So we may go direct to corporates or we may also and we and we do it as well in the in the education space. Brilliant. Okay, and, and so education space, presumably that's that's universities in particular. Yeah, yeah, it's universities. So we have about six hundred fifty thousand students have access to our our platform and services. Um, that's the likes of University College London, London School of Economics, University of Manchester, Birmingham, Southampton. So we've got a really great set of logos and, and clients in that space. And, uh, you know, I think what's kind of happened because of the pressures in the UK health system is that universities have been kind of tasked with a much higher level of um, expectations on what their duty of care to students are. Mm. You've kind of got that on the backdrop of kind of a little bit of a funding crisis within universities. So what we're trying to do is help them, you know, meet their duty of care needs, but without them necessarily maybe employing all of the people internally to do that. You know, universities have kind of, yeah, they have the pressure to try and be both educators, but also care providers. And, you know, at the same time, yeah. And that, that can be a real challenge for them. They have got a, they've got a duty of care, haven't they, to the students? Um, and, and, and so as far as the student would be concerned, if I went to UCL you know, and I logged onto uh, the, the, this platform, they would just think that it's UCL's platform, but really yeah. it's your tech that's driving it behind the scenes. Yeah, exactly. And when a student logs in, they're going to see, you know, really specific content to like student mm -hmm. problems. They're going to see students or people that look like them. So it's going to yeah. feel personalized you know, about, you know, dealing with anxiety, dealing with change, yeah. dealing, you know, all the kind of stuff that a student might experience. And based on how they interact with the platform, then we send nudges for them to access mental health services if, if, if they need them. But also what we do for universities is, you know, help them. They have a duty of care to make sure if a student needs extra supports via a type of kind of a neurodiversity assessment that can then help the right university know that actually this student needs a little bit more support mm. in terms of how they might access ed, 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 you know their educational needs so it's a, a really exciting part actually it's something because for us at a product level we see obviously those students as the you know the adults of the future or the you know the the, the insurance customers of the future i suppose so yeah. we use the product that we kind of design at that level to be thinking about actually what does that product need to be in a year's or two, two or three years time when those people are maybe buying health insurance or buying you know life or group income protection insurance for the first time yeah for sure or, or even working for a you know a corporate that that might exactly. do that as well exactly, yeah, exactly. I like so it. it's, okay it's great. Really an, you know we don't we can't obviously experiment in that area because we're still looking after people's health care but it just gives us an opportunity to push the boundaries from a, a little bit more how did you arrive here then? What's your background? What's your story? So I started working with our co-founder uh, and uh, executive chair at Spectrum Life Stewart in another one of his businesses uh, called The Physio Company. It was my very, very first job out of college. Um, I joined as a digital marketing executive. That business was kind of a chain of physio clinics across Ireland. Right. And it was really kind of 
B2C and had physical locations. Sure. Um, in, in college, I had um, I had spent a lot of time building websites kind of as a side hustle. And so, you know, I had my own website where I was doing AdWords and doing all sorts of different things. So I kind of self-taught myself in terms of digital marketing, website building, all that kind of stuff. I joined that business probably at the right time when that was a really important, uh, I suppose, commercial uh, driver of growth for that business, but also they were rebuilding websites and all sorts of different things. So I was just able to get in and do things that I was probably a little bit too strong minded for my own good back then, but I was able to get stuck into areas that were bottlenecks for the business and kind of solve problems that no one else could. And I think Stuart really admired that approach and we worked really well over the last last 12 years. So then when the physio company was working more with corporates and insurers and in areas like mental health, and Stuart approached me saying he wanted to spin out a, a standalone company focused on B2B and digital. He invited me to be CEO. Uh, it was six years ago. I was only 27 at the time. So he took a big risk and uh, I'll be always grateful that he did. Yeah, wow. And I, and I guess that, that leads nicely into the, into the next question then. Um, uh, you know, we, we got a lot of other founders and co-founders that, that listen to this show. And I always like to find out how you guys navigate challenges because, of course, you, you know, in the startup world or the business world, it's very, very, very rarely plain sailing. Um, talk us through it. What challenges have you had and how do you how do you best overcome them? Yeah, so look, I, I kind of would look at my journey in kind of three stages, you know, um, and, and I think it looks at my kind of evolution over time. You know, when we were starting out, we only had like 20 or 30 employees. So you had to be in the weeds of every kind of decision and every aspect of the business. You know, you had to be an active kind of practitioner and operation, finance, sales, you know, everything. Right. I actually really enjoyed that. Um, and, it, you know, it set me well to be knowledge and love on the practicality of running the, the business, not really necessarily the theory. So I suppose at that stage of the business for me, it was about getting really, really involved, really detailed into the, into the kind of how the mechanics of the business worked. And I suppose now when I reflect on where I am now in the business, I'm much more focused on that was what was immediately in front of me, but actually what's about a, a, a few years ahead of us. But I, I, you know, I think in terms of one of the key items for me in terms of at a macro level, in terms of managing and navigating running a business, I suppose, I really found practicing self-care was super important. You know, I think looking after myself, um, making the right time to eat, sleep and exercise, take walks, enjoy time with your family. You know, a few years ago, I think kind of when we were kind of growing from maybe 100 to 200 employees, um, I, I kind of felt really burned out, you know, quite tired. I didn't, I wasn't really looking after myself. Uh, I don't think if I had made a real pivot at that point, I would be the CEO I am today. You know, I kind of got the support I needed. Um, it's been really transformational for me. And I and I think in the kind of founder and entrepreneurial community, stuff like over exhaustion and, and working every weekend and pushing the limits out has has really been kind of over romanticized, I think. Yeah. And I think there's a sense that pushing yourself physically and emotionally is leadership. We were only talking about before we got on how, how hard it is actually to do it, right? Yeah. But I, I think actually if you step back and you spend a bit more time on thinking about uh, how your organization uh, operates to understand and take the time to explain to people what we are, why we're doing it, what's expected of them. Uh, you really, you know, want to help spend time on the systems of scale, right? You know, not necessarily constantly on the doing and pushing yourself into the doing. Um, I think you'd be a much more powerful leader, you know, and I, I felt that was probably the most transformational thing that I've done as, as a leader in my organization is actually taking the time to look after myself so that we could actually be better leaders for the for, for our people. Sure, I think that's really insightful. Thanks for sharing that. Like, so so what, what do you do, block out time in your calendar every week to, you know, you say this is, this is a hard stop because I'm doing X and Y or? Yeah, you know, you know, making sure between eight and 10, is, that's your time to get ahead of what you have for the day. You know, being really clear about that, you know, not letting anyone else kind of get into that. So you have that time in the morning to be able to get ready for your day, focus on your thoughts, focus on your priorities, get your emails out, you know, because there can be a sense that you're just in a meeting after meeting after meeting if you're, yeah. if you're a leader or a founder and you can't do that. You need to get ahead of stuff. You need to have your, your head in the game. 
Um, and the only way you can do that is actually, you know, people may say to get up earlier to do that. And that, that might work for some people, you know, but after a while, you know, it's, it, 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 it's going to get uh, too, too hard to do that. You can't just, you know, keep pushing yourself harder and harder. Um, and, I, and I think the other thing is then at the end of the day, I'd always make two or three hours for me to go on a walk, go to the gym. You know, me getting to the gym every single day is, is really, really important for me being on top. So I think if you top and tail your day, in a way that allows you to perform to your best self, I think then in the middle, you can actually be really involved, really in the moment with people when you're talking to them and not just kind of jumping from meeting to meeting to meeting. Sure. Thanks for that. That was, that was great. And I, I remember talking to you last time and, you, and you, you mentioned that a huge part of your role is communication. Um, you guys are, I think you're, are you over 200 employees now and, and they're all pretty much remote. Um, how do you tackle that and keep the, the, the you know keep the culture going? Yeah, we're we're two hundred and eighty people um, right. all over the UK and Ireland, and we'll probably be close to I'd say four fifty five hundred by this time next year. Yeah. Um, so I think you know we, I think this year I really got the capacity to be able to enter into a new kind of phase of that. Um, we have quite a strong, we're a very strong exec team. We're now building an equally strong kind of leadership team below that. Um, and, you know, we set out at the start of the year about being really clear about what our objectives are across the whole organization and tying those objectives to our values. So our number one objective is to save and change as many lives as possible. So we're able to frame growth in actually how we impact more people's lives. So that that kind of just helps the whole thing kind of work. So we uh, communicated our objectives. Everyone in the business would be having full uh you know, view of those objectives, including the financial ones. You gotta be yeah. really transparent about that, really clear about people where actually this is a commercial business. In order for us to be sustainable and to be here in the long run and serve people, we need to let you know yeah. that there's a financial aspect to that. So communicating everything up front, being really transparent about actually what those financial goals are. Some people want to keep that to their chest. They don't, you know, don't want everyone to know. Don't, you know, it's none of their business type thing, but people really do value transparency and understanding why they're doing something. Then I think what we've done this year is we cascaded kind of really clear objectives across every department and every individual. And uh, we've got really, really intentional around what our kind of communication structures are. So that's, you know, every every group team having a weekly team meeting, every set of leadership teams then having a monthly meeting every the company then having a, a, a monthly or quarterly town hall making sure managers have their one-to-ones you know really just making sure that the information what we're trying to achieve as an organization cascades across the entire organization so i think i'm a big believer when people know what they have to do why they have to do it and what's expected of them they will actually perform phenomenally well and they'll understand it won't feel like something just coming from left field. Hey, we want you, want you to do this because there's a deadline next week. You know, you have to give people context so they have a sense of control yeah. and an understanding of why they're doing something. Sure. No, 100%. Thank you for that. Um, last question then, Stephen. What, what's, what comes next? What, what's uh, exciting that you can share for the listeners? So, yeah, we've just closed uh, uh, a 17 million funding round uh, that was led with, with by ACT uh, Venture Capital. Um, so, you know, for us, that's really about continued to fund our growth into the future. Uh, we, we expect to grow by 60% between now and the end of 2025. Um, a lot of that growth is in really large digital transformation projects with insurers. So over the next uh, few months, you'll, you'll hear announcements of new insurers that we're working with. We, you know, currently work with the likes of Bupa, uh, Legal and General, Bennett and Health in the UK, Leia Healthcare in Ireland. So we've got a, a good list of digital transformation projects in the pipeline. Uh, but we're also really continuing to focus on our funding of, of of technology. So investments in AI are are are, are really really important. We've got a great um, uh, announcement coming next next month in terms of what we're doing in, in in AI, and that's really about us not replacing clinicians, but aiming to improve the clinician digital environment so that they can serve uh, patients more efficiently. Uh, the funding also supports us adding markets outside of the UK of Ireland. You know, we're now 50% of our people and revenue is in the UK. Uh, we're at about 25 million run rate and we want to get to 100 million by um, 2028. Uh, and we want 25 of that, 25 million of that revenue to be outside of UK and Ireland. So 
We're expanding outside. We're looking at markets in Europe, Middle East, Asia, and Australia. There are lots of insurers around the world that have the same digital transformation needs that we've solved in the UK. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really exciting time. There's a lot of momentum behind digital transformation in the insurance and, and digital health space more broadly. And uh, yeah, for us, we just want to be known as a global leader in, in, in digital health. Neva, thanks so much for joining us. It's been great chatting to you. Um, you know, thanks for your transparency on that as well. Um, and I look forward to um, having a, a second run of the podcast next year and see where you're up to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can hold me to account. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Lee. <laughs> Guys, this has been Stephen Costello, co-founder and CEO of Spectrum Life. Thanks again.